Another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. This week we are talking to the amazing Helena Woodfield about what we need to do with our dogs if they show reactivity or antisocial behaviour. Welcome, Helena. Hi, it's lovely to be invited on. Thanks for having me. Before we get into this week's episode, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you became involved in dog training? Actually, this is a very um, sort of relevant story so my um, first dog that I got when I was 19 he was a lovely gorgeous fluffy Wheaton Terrier and unfortunately he showed severe signs of reactivity and aggression uh, which was ultimately because of a brain tumour so I was never going to be able to train it out of him (laughs) but he you know he got me into it he's the reason I want to you know pursue behaviour and why I have such an innate interest in helping people with you know, these sorts of issues. So I know that you're a full-time trainer for LWDG group expert Emma Stevens over in Cunning Shop Dog Training. Do you absolutely love that job? I absolutely do, actually. It is um, it is, it is so fun. I love it. I love working with dogs. I love um, working with owners. I specifically love working with pointers because I think I might be mad, but I really do. <laughs> I know we do have a small group of pointer owners in the uh, LWDG. So, Helena, that you're now going to become their go-to for anything HPR. But you're also doing some sort of qualifications around dog behaviour as well. Is that right? Yeah, so I've done I've done quite a few courses. Um, but at the moment, I'm working on my uh, be- final behaviour degree, essentially, um, looking to work with a lot more kind of vet, vet behaviour, basically. Fantastic. So a degree is quite an in-depth study around this. So you are the perfect person for us to talk about to about reactivity and antisocial behaviour. What is reactivity? So from my perspective, reactivity is where your dog is having a reaction to something. So this is either a trigger or something in its environment, which means that it can't cope with with that thing anymore. So this could be from a place of fear, could become from a place of excitement or over arousal. It doesn't have to just be, um, you know, something like nervousness. Um, But what's happening essentially is your dog is simply acting on site of of this, this trigger. And it doesn't also have to be sight. It could be smell or other senses that cause this reaction. So this can be things that are known to the dog to be triggering. So something like another dog or a human or reacting to novelty. So, you know, the the Gruffalo on the Gruffalo trail. I do remember my sister's dog reacting to that because it was simply the strangest thing she'd ever come across. But if you think kind of in terms of like when horses spook, that's essentially a reaction. For example, if you think dogs that are so excited to meet other dogs, that's a version of reactivity that's that's coming out. So they're not able to think, oh, if I calm down, maybe that dog will want to meet me a bit more. So they're, they're not thinking in that situation. So I would say, yeah, reaction reactions can come from overexcitement. It's essentially it's an inability for the dog to regulate their own emotions is what I'd say. And that coming out as an outburst. So something like barking or if you have pointers screaming <laughs> or you know the, the kind of over it can come from over excitement if you think about fear that's a much like much more deeper sort of bark so that would come from you know if your dog's sort of doing a very low deep bark that would be where we'd be thinking hmm, maybe this is a reaction to novelty because we're unsure rather than a, a reaction to I really want to get to that other person or dog so to put it in dog terms like when I first started going out with my dad used to say um you'd see somebody's dog screaming through the shoot people screaming at the dog and he'd say oh the red mist is down which Mm. was that sort of like they've lost any sense of of what they should or shouldn't be doing and they were just instinctively reacting Mm -hmm. 
for us all, obviously, we don't want to be that person with that dog. You know, if you've got a black cocker, you're okay because every black <laughs> cocker looks alike. Um, or if you've got a black lab, if you've got a, a distinctively marked spaniel, you're done over. And I'm sure if you've got a pointer, you're done over too because there's not so many yep. of them. Um, but once, what is it, first of all, what has it taken for the dog to get there? Is it in the point of between? A dog having a, a normal sense of mind to becoming reactive. Is there any triggers that we would see that we think, hold on, this is going this way? Yes. So depending on, on what emotion is, is causing the reaction, um, usually we can tell beforehand that something's going to happen. So if you know that your dog is slightly worried by um, other dogs and people, we can kind of we can kind of tell there's, there'll be a, dif- a distance or a threshold that your dog will reach before it will, you know, when, that's when the reaction will start. So what we're looking at is kind of giving lots of distance for the dog and and simply rewarding them, praising them, giving them, you know, fuss or, or food reward and reinforcing this sort of distance from the trigger. So what we'd be looking at is, OK, what what's their body language like? Is Are they are they very switched on to it? Are they looking at it? Are they very rigid? Are they tensing up because they're in, in sort of the vicinity of something that A, either they want to really get to or B, something that they're not so sure about. So a little test that I like to do to tell whether my dog is under threshold is to just ask them to do the normal thing. So can you just sit? If you can sit and you can do it on cue, you're thinking. So I can then reward you for that. And I know that we're not actually in the realms of my brain is switching off. I can't cope anymore. So when I'm when I'm working with a dog that has reactivity issues, we obviously spend an awful lot of time at a distance from the trigger and we kind of we reinforce for simply being around it. But the kind of test to can we move closer is, OK, can you do a sit? Can you do a lie down? Do you know your name? You know, can you are you capable of rational thought? <laughs> and then maybe we can move a little bit closer, run through all of the same things. So reward for being in its vicinity. And then we run through the little test again. So when you mentioned then the term under threshold, is, is that what we're looking? We're looking as a dog being under threshold or I'm assuming the opposite is over threshold? Exactly. One hundred percent. So is it like when we talk about reactivity, you know, we talk about things like um, a gun shy dog or gun nervous dog or a dog that maybe is not really comfortable around vehicles when you're talking then about checking how they're feeling about things at distance it's like sort of taking them far away finding the point at which that becomes uncomfortable for want of a better word is it yeah that's right so we kind of want we we never really want to be putting a dog in a position where they're feeling uncomfortable so what we're trying to do is work way way far underneath that threshold so if we know that the dog is comfortable at 100 yards away from it we'll start at 100 and very gradually start to reduce that distance so what we're looking for is that the dog can fully switch off from that trigger so let's let's say it is shot what we want to do is make sure that the dog is able to actually focus on the owner make sure they can listen to all of these sort of very easy things that they know super well like their name like sit like you know can you do a little sit and wait and then once we know that they can they're they're doing that they're actually switched off from it so they're no longer going hmm a shot just went off (laughs) I'm worried about it or hey there's a dog over there I really want to go and see it so what we're doing is we're just checking that they can that they're capable of switching off for it which is what I mean when I say can you think properly (laughs) yeah and that's a that's a really good point as well isn't it because on talking to you now um, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this episode will be thinking about their own dog you know that sort of difference in body posture very alert to the thing not very alert to you sort of dis- not disengaged from you but also almost being like I want to listen to you mum but I'm actually more concerned with what I can see or hear or, or smell over there what starts reactivity in the sense of like because a lot of people might see it and say okay my dog just ran out um after that smell or after that bowl, it's just overly excited and it's having fun and this isn't an issue. Where does it go from being just like fooling about to being actually a, a challenge and, and a permanent challenge towards that thing? 
So it depends. If you if you think about squirrel chasing, obviously there'll be a first instance of squirrel chasing. And that is kind of the one, the, the thing that will start to form a habit. So if it happens again and again and again, and usually what happens is owners kind of don't realize that it's it's happening. You'll go, oh, he's just bolted off after something. The next walk, oh, it's just happened again. Three walks later, you'll be like, oh no, he's he's squirrel chasing. So it's kind of being switched on to how these habits build. So if you think about um, this in terms of reactivity, we might find that, okay, my dog had a weird altercation yesterday with another dog and that dog, you know, really scared him. If we then expose them again and again and again to the same sort of interaction, they're going to start to build almost like a, it's almost like an attitude. So rather, rather squirrel chasing is a habitual, yes, I'd really like to chase that squirrel. What we're seeing with reactivity, it's, it's more emotional. So it's the same kind of thing They're building almost like, almost like an attitude towards a specific thing so what you can do is if your dog has, has had something scary or something that sent them a little bit wild because it isn't only fear re- related you want to be really switched on to those you know very high and high level kind of is it fear related is it excitement but these these things that are very extreme in emotion and what you want to be doing is being okay well actually she chased that squirrel and she was barking her head off (laughs) maybe we don't want to let that happen again or you know she's seen a person the person was wearing a hat she was very scared so you just want to be kind of you want to be very observant I would say so if your dog is having some kind of extreme emotional reaction what we want is to be okay let's let's just take a distance from people or let's just you know give her lots of fuss and reward every time we see people for the next week for for example so what we're doing is we're going hmm let's not let this become a habit or let's not let this become an attitude that she that she's forming because usually it does usually if they're optimistic dogs one time isn't enough for them to go okay I'm gonna have a generalized fear so what you can then do is start to kind of go okay let's let's prevent that from happening and start to just every dog we see or every person we see we're going to start to rebuild that very positive or even neutral attitude towards them and these sort of reactivities like um obviously I'm not a dog I couldn't talk so wonderfully well in my Welsh accent when I went through my tumors I developed PTSD and I got quite severe anxiety as well and now for example if I go in somewhere like a restaurant to eat I have to put my back to a wall now it's like a really weird thing right now I wasn't in a restaurant when I had the operation and it had nothing to do with it. But one fear has transferred into something else as well. So when we see a reactivity in a dog around something, can then that become a generalised issue with other things? Yeah. So what you can, if you think about it in terms of, say, for okay, yeah, a really good example of this might be, let's say your dog meets another dog in the street. That dog really takes a disliking to them and they get attacked but at the same time a bus goes past and it's very big and loud and scary what you might find is something exactly like what you've just described your dog may you know associate the pain of being attacked by that other dog with the bus going past so what we what we see is things that are completely out of our control we can't control what's going on around our dogs when good or bad things are happening as much as we'd love to we can't (laughs) not always but yeah you're absolutely right so these things can become you can get sort of associations that are far removed from the actual incident but because something happened at the same time as it you can absolutely get that and then I suppose as owners it's really hard sometimes for us to pinpoint where that reactivity is coming from because sometimes you you know we see in the group people are like my dog is behaving this way and I'm really not sure why it's this behavior because I don't know why this behavior would be an issue to that dog so it could have been something that's happened that, that we are not seeing the connection but the dog certainly does Absolutely, absolutely. You're completely correct. So with regards to reactivity, obviously on um, a short podcast like this, it's it's too broad a a subject to go into, like, this is how you fix it. Plus, it obviously needs a behaviourist such as yourself to be there and looking at a specific dog in a specific environment to work forward on the problem. But what should we do if we start seeing things and we're thinking, like, generally, this this is really starting to become a concern for my dog or I think there's something 
wrong in this place what's our first port of call so it it does really depend on the dog and the incident but essentially distance is going to be your friend and that can be in terms of time so putting distance between you and the and the event putting distance between the dog and the event that might have been scary or over exciting because what we need them to do is just have a bit of time off to decompress from it and then my sort of baseline go-to advice is leave a lot of distance between you and the trigger and just keep things very short and sweet and positive what we don't want to do is tell our dogs off for reacting and you know getting over threshold because a they're probably not capable of listening to you but b if it is coming from a fearful place we're not we're not helping them in any way we're actually telling them that there's a reason to be scared because we don't we don't want to be being negative in that in that situation so distance both in terms of physical distance from the trigger and temporal distance from any event that might have happened short sessions of being exposed to the trigger and um, lots of positivity is what I would say. And like sort of building on that as well, I suppose um, to go back to my restaurant challenge, it can be frustrating. Like for my husband, he's like, well, why can't we have that seat in the middle of the room? And I'm like, no, we have to wait. And that can be frustrating for him. And I suppose as owners, we can get frustrated when um, what seems quite irrational to us, and that wasn't a problem last week, but is a problem this week, it, It's hard for us, isn't it? Because, and again, we have this sort of second challenge, which is the dog can't actually tell us what the problem is either. No, they definitely can't. And I do massively sympathise and empathise with owners of reactive dogs because sometimes it can be extremely unpredictable. And all I'd say is if your dog is kind of, if your dog is a little bit all over the shop in that like, okay, well this week that tissue blowing on the floor is going to be the scary thing. What I'd say is just give, just have a think about what, what other things you've done that week. So has your dog had a big change in routine? Have you, you know, have they been on their own a little bit more? Have they gone for the same sort of walks or has, have they had a very busy weekend? You know, whatever, whatever sort of thing you've been doing, just have a, have a think about where they might be in terms of, you know out of routine are they have they been a bit overexposed to things and just consider maybe giving them a day off (laughs) it's not it's not wrong to not walk your dog for a day (laughs) it's difficult as owners because we definitely have this kind of ingrained attitude of right I must walk my dog if I don't I'm a terrible owner but especially with kind of emotional regulation letting them decompress not walking your dog can often be a godsend for them so we're talking, you know, about like sort of generalised reactivity and we're seeing a different behaviour in our dog, whether that's sort of open up and excitement or, or this sort of nervousness. What about when, for some owners, that reactivity becomes almost an aggressive behaviour? What happens when that nervousness is not nervousness now, it's almost a, a flight or fight, and this turn to fight is literally, I'm going to attack everything. What happens then? Honestly, it's the same. It's the same kind of thing. I mean, obviously, you'd you'd need to talk to a behaviorist at that point because your dog is, you know, exhibiting potentially dangerous behavior um, and would need to you'd need to enlist the uh, help of a professional. But the advice would probably be much the same. So this is why it's so important for, like I mentioned earlier, if if you're noticing some changes in your dog, if you're noticing changes in attitude, get in there as quickly as you can and go right I can see that she's a bit weird about people let's just make every interaction with people or sight of a person something really positive and obviously if dogs are are showing you know growling or you know showing that kind of more aggressive um body language it would be much the same if at that point they're they're having a very severe reaction. So you would still need to give them distance and keep things very, very positive, but obviously with the help of a behaviourist. It's quite interesting talking to you now about this because I think about times I don't have gone to a park and you see people whose dogs are like literally pulling at the lead and barking quite angrily at you and your dog on the lead. I've never really thought about the fact that that could just almost be a fear-based reaction rather than them just being a bit of a nasty dog it could be they were showing us that they just don't want us to come near them yeah that's exactly what they're doing so 
it's very infrequent that you get a dog that is genuinely like yes I'd really love to just go and eat another dog (laughs) usually these usually these things come out of basically it's a it's them having to practice telling other dogs to go away so if they're if they're barking at you and your dog or growling and lunging and and really seeming quite um combative what you'd what they're telling you is please don't come near me it's not a question of them going I want to get to you usually it's just that they've probably had to rehearse this behavior so many times that they're that quick to tell you yeah no I don't want I don't want you in my face I don't want you in my space and this is why I keep I keep coming back to make sure you start to notice these behavior changes for changes very quickly and very early on you see quite a lot though like when we're talking about like keeping space between us and and the other dogs sometimes that's nearly impossible like mm-hmm. there's quite a huge amount of conversations on social media at the moment about people's control of their dogs and most people are told with a pet dog oh let them run about let them play let them sort of roll each other over it's good for them that socialization and that's like a real generalized idea of socialization it's not at all what it should be but that's what people think it looks like so then when we take a dog that is, has got sort of reactivity issues or aggression issues into a park to have a normal walk and just be a normal dog, all this sort of attack, constant waves of dogs running up to it, up to it, up to it, it's a lot for a dog then, isn't it, to be able to even cope with just a basic walk? Yeah, 100%. And I, so as a trainer, I've been in both the position of the um, owner with the highly aggressive dog. Um, and I've also been in the position of the owner with a highly overfriendly dog. <laughs> so what I'd say, if you have a dog that is reactive or starting to show reactive tendencies, unfortunately, for a little while, every walk is going to be training. So it's going to be, OK, we're going to go, we're going to either stand in the car park and we're going to watch other dogs. If, you know, obviously all dogs require exercise, um, but. I honestly did used to walk my dog at sort of 11 o'clock at night so that we wouldn't see anybody. But equally, you can. um, So I'm a big fan of the yellow dog campaign. So this is kind of I wear yellow. I used to have a big vest that uh, just said, keep away. (laughs) Um, I'm very, I'm very, you know, I'm a big advocate of using muzzles, making sure that my dog or, you know, my client's dog who, who might be aggressive or have aggression, aggression issues. um, I'm, I try and make sure that they are as protected as possible. um, Because the worst thing would be that my dog actually bit anybody or anything. So yeah, I think it would be a question of making sure that you have put into place as much management and safety protocols as possible Um, but equally you do you do have to you do have to be quite forceful with the public and say look please don't let your dog come up to us I've done everything that I can you need to now do everything that you can so from the perspective that's from the perspective of an owner with um that hasn't has a potentially aggressive or highly reactive dog but from the perspective of an owner that has a highly over friendly dog I have probably spent over the course of the last 18 months that with my dog on a long line doing the exact same thing as if she was a highly aggressive dog we take huge amounts of distance we reinforce that distance she gets so much so many rewards for you know just simply watching at the dogs and now we walk past them as if they're nothing and everyone looks at me and says wow you're so lucky she's so well behaved (laughs) But it is honestly the same thing because they one is, you know, one is from a place of I don't want dogs in my space. And the other is I want to be in every dog space. So arguably the protocols are very similar. We need to put distance and tell you what to do in the situation of like you can't be running up to every other dog. So it's a question of not letting your dog simply act and make choices that are going to potentially be life changing for them if they run up to the wrong dog. I liked what you said then about muzzles now I'm like you I believe it is better for my dog to have a muzzle on and it live than it to have a muzzle off and it attack somebody or you know attack another dog would be drastic enough attacking a child or a human would be horrific the repercussions of an aggressive attack is possibly the end of that dog's life I think as well people feel scared to put on the jacket put on the muzzle but they really shouldn't be should they because what they're trying to tell other people is I am trying to be proactive 
in ensuring these situations don't happen. Can you be proactive and keep your dog away from mine, please? It's not a case of you being antisocial or wanting people to leave you alone. It's a case of you wanting to protect them and the dog you love. Yeah, 100%. So like I mentioned earlier, the yellow dog campaign, it's a very much, it's becoming more and more prominent um, and people do recognise it. But I'd also just shout out the Muzzle Up project, which is both on Facebook and um, Instagram. But they are massive advocates for muzzle training because obviously you can't just whack a muzzle on a dog. They have no idea what that means. It's um, It can be really, really strange for them to have something simply over their face you know it's yeah. one of the, and their nose especially it's it's one of the primary ways that they explore the world so then to put something over it it's it can be very strange so yeah I'll, I, the muzzle up project are fantastic and I would urge anybody who is considering using a muzzle with their dog make sure it's a it's a basket muzzle make sure it's something that they can pant through drink eat they should be able to do everything swim they can do everything with the muzzle on providing that they've got the space to do it so um, I really don't like the sort of soft muzzles that really hold their mouth shut because they they can't exercise with that one they can't breathe <laughs> well if you just even think of humans reactions to wearing face masks over the last two years yeah the amount of people I've heard who said I can't breathe through it and I'm thinking you can breathe through it because you're talking to me but there is that thing none of us like what is our predominant way of staying alive being covered by something else so yeah I, I fully agree with you the, you know the basket ones it, it is allowing them to still use their senses and have the same life, but stopping them from taking another step forward. And, you know, to me, a muzzle on an aggressive dog is no different to you putting a seatbelt on a child. It's a protection of something happening. Not that it's going to happen, but it could happen. So let's not let it happen. We put links to those two projects in our show notes so they're there for everybody to see. But when we're talking about antisocial behavior and reactivity as what can we do with a pup to you've got your new pup to just get them you know used to being socialized around other people just the general stuff that they're going to see day to day and predominantly other dogs what is the right way to allow them to explore the world but not interfere in other people's worlds yeah so from i think the best advice i can give on that is get to know dog body language I think that's probably the most important thing as an owner that that we should be that we should be learning about it's the only way that you can communicate or your dog can communicate to you and if you're good at reading canine body language you understand where your how your pup is feeling so you know if they are worried by things you can really sort of get get underneath that get get control of that and you know start to expose them to the scary thing gradually so that it doesn't become something that's a big problem for them in the future but equally you can then look at other people's dogs and you can say "Hmm, actually that dog doesn't look quite so happy so we're not going to go near you or you know if your dog is playing with another dog you can start to say well actually she's been doing a little bit of air snapping let's let's leave you alone we're going to carry on with our walk I think definitely body language is probably the most important thing, but equally controlling the interactions that your dog has with other dogs um, and people, um, because, you know, some people can be scary. <laughs> um, and my dog, she she became quite worried by by men because they stooped over in a shop to say hello. And it, it was terrifying. So immediately I decided, OK, every man you meet, you don't have to meet them, but you're going to get lots of nice biscuits for it. Yeah. So it's essentially being able to, I guess, control the interactions that your dog has with people and dogs. So don't be afraid to say to them, no, sorry, we're not meeting you. I know she's cute, but (laughs) but we're not going to we're not going to say hello today. Or, you know, if you're if you're seeing other dogs on the park, if there's a lot of them, you don't know those dogs. So I'd probably much rather let my dog actually just watch them and be comfortable watching them at a distance and then we'll carry on our walk so we're not we're not putting our dog into positions where we can't predict the outcome essentially I think as well like you know you said about how cute they are um my mum's got a 
Cavapoo and like literally wherever that dog goes people think it's an open invitation to come touch her and I'm like it infuriates me for somebody who suffers with uh, anxiety for, it's not the dog that's got the issue in this she's absolutely fine but it's me people invading my space and it can be both ways can't it there's no there's nothing that says oh just because I have a dog on a lead or off a lead means that you are allowed to think and I'm not about being antisocial because I don't pass a single person outside this house without saying good morning or good afternoon I'm, I'm very I don't know I was brought up quite old-fashioned in that way I always say very few people say it back to me they just look at me and like I'm a little bit odd but I do it and I, I, I want to encourage my children to be like that but it doesn't mean you have to be within one foot of my face does it you know you can just say hello to other dogs by keeping a distance enough that they can see each other but not be on top of each other yeah so I it's actually funny you should mention that because I, so I have a friend who had a Alsatian so it's a German Shepherd Akita cross it was quite an intimidating looking dog but he was soft as anything he used to walk with my friend and she did suffer with quite extreme anxiety and he would almost be like a deterrent <laughs> so she would be able to walk him people would cross the street and she'd be quite comfortable with that but now she has an Airedale and the Airedale is obviously such a sweetie as well but obviously she attracts a lot more attention because she's gorgeous and curly and fluffy <laughs> but obviously my my friend does she does, still has anxiety <laughs> and is kind of you know, obviously same, similar to you. She doesn't want people coming up to her on every walk, even though Zena would quite like that. <laughs> I bet she's thinking I need to get another one of those dangerous <laughs> yeah. dogs. Mind you, I think sometimes Jack Russells can be quite formidable. They have got such a loud voice that people tend to not like to come up to them either. Um, I actually don't actually see them people going up to Jack Russells. If you watch, the whole of all the population of the UK know that Jack Russells shouldn't always be trusted because yeah. they've seen a naughty one um right okay so um with regards to socializing there is a master class by Claire Denia on this so that's available in our resources and also there are two master classes on body language um www.blwdg.com but if people want to get hold of you personally Helena how do they do that so they can either go and have a look at cunning shot dog training um because I'm a dog dog trainer for um emma stevens at cunning shot dog training so i'm on there um, and you can probably find my email address there as well but i'm also on instagram just my name helena woodfield <laughs> so yeah that's probably the best ways to find me and you're also in our open community and our members oh, yeah. lounge so people can find you in there too thank you very very much for your time recording this episode i think i know quite a lot more now about reactivity and antisocial behavior and it's made me start thinking a little bit more about what i can do before there's a problem where i can start looking at indicators and definitely a chance to maybe go and read a little bit more about the body language and watch the master classes a little bit more thank you very much for your time today i know you're one of our forthcoming featured experts with a master class so we look forward to that as well and uh, we look forward to speaking to all our listeners again next week on the next episode of lwdg pod dog mm-hmm.